Thanks for that introduction. And thanks also to Scott and Haley for inviting me to make this uh, introduction today of Ian Logan and Jonathan Glancy. When they invited me to do this, I immediately said yes. Uh, their book, Logomotive, Railroad Graphics and the American Dream, made a real strong impression on me and a surprising impression at that several months ago when I reviewed it for the uh, Center's Railroad Heritage Journal. I say surprising because here was a subject I figured had been done to death. Nothing likely is more familiar to the people attending the conference today than the logos and the iconography of North American railroads, the, the Pensy Keystone, the Santa Fe War Bonnet, the Wabash flag, even Penn Central's worms, and many, many more, old, all of them old, familiar friends. So what can we learn that's new? Well, plenty, it turned out. Ian and Jonathan infused the subject with enthusiasm and passion, yet they never lose their objectivity, thanks to their accomplishments in the fields of graphics and design. They transcend merely being fans. And of course, they also bring a fresh perspective from 4,000 miles across the pond, which I think is really great. So I think you're in for a treat this morning. And so with that, I'm ple pleased to turn this over to uh, Ian Logan and Jonathan Glancy. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, indeed. Oh, hi, I'm Ian Logan, and I think Jonathan is there somewhere, but I'm not sure. I'm quite nervous about this. I've never done this before, but thank you very, very much for having us, and um, I hope you enjoy the uh, what, what we're going to put on. Um, I'll give you a little bit about my background. Um, I come from a very small town in the west of England. Uh, there we go. Oh, well, we'll go on to, to the, it, it, the... What we're going to talk about is the story of the book, basically. Um, and uh, you can see the book, I think. Well, you could... That, um, we, you, the, the book had a lot of different covers. I think we had up to sort of, I don't know, 30, 40 different covers and um, before we decided what to do. I originally did the book in the 1970s, uh, before the internet, and uh, I roamed around America for about five or six weeks, going to different towns, and sort of with people saying to me, oh, you should go to Kansas City, there's a big yard there, you can get into that one and take some photographs. So I did this and I took probably four or 500 pictures. A lot of them aren't in the book. Um, and um, I just walked around freight yards, which of course now I don't think I would be able to. Uh, I am hoping that Jonathan is on somewhere so that I can introduce him. Um, when we... When we have, the first book I did was called Lost Glory, uh, and I was going to keep this title for the new book, but when I approached Union Pacific and said, would you let us use your logos, they just said no, and I couldn't work out why, and then they came back to me and said, look, we're a going railroad line, and um, we're not Lost Glory. <laughs> So that's one of the reasons we had to change the name, which was fair enough. Um, I think Jonathan's then a... Um, I met Jonathan some years ago. He is a, a journalist and an author and has written lots of books about trains and travel. Um, and he was the perfect person to do the writing in the book. I'm not a writer. Uh, I I just have the enthusiasm and the visual sort of delight at uh, traveling across America photographing them. Um, anyway, if we go on to the next. I come from a small town in the west of England, um, which was quite an interesting town. It was on the Great Western Line, and uh, which was mostly designed by Brunel. Um, okay. uh, the, <laughs> This is where I lived. I lived in a 1600 house that was built for Flemish weavers. And uh, that's my mother there. And I have a little Austin 7, which I bought when I was 18. 
I'm now 80 and I still have it. <laughs> Next one. Uh, this is the station that um, I stood on this bridge that's above and looked at steam trains coming through and uh, collected the, the morning newspapers when I had a newspaper uh, round. Okay. Um, Caution, where I came from, was renowned for stone. There's a, a town in the west of England called Bath. Bath is totally built of this stone, and it is called Bath Stone. And it comes from a quarry, which is just down the line. And that's the Brunel Tunnel on the Great Western. And the steam train that you see coming out of there is the quarry. Now that quarry is 62 square miles underground. Um, and after the stone was sort of finished, it was turned over to the Ministry of Defense. And in the Second World War, it was the largest ammunition dump in Europe. Um, plus, it was also an aircraft factory making engines for Bristol Aeroplane Company. Uh, my father was an engineer in Bristol Aeroplane Company, and we were bombed out of Bristol and uh, came to live in Caution because of this underground. It's still owned by the Ministry of Defence, but you can't see that, uh, that tunnel on the right-hand side. I, when, I was, when I left school, I entered a company called Westinghouse Brake and Signal Company. Um, now, Westinghouse Brake and Signal Company is quite an interesting company. It, it, it was, as it describes, it made brakes and uh, uh, items for British Rail and for the London Underground, mostly. Um, I worked, I was an apprentice in the drawing office. That's me above and below. I worked for this man called Oswald Nock, O.S. Nock, and Ken Leach. O.S. Nock um, is very famous in England, as he's done over 100 books on the Great Western Railway. And it was always very interesting when we were in the drawing office, we used to watch him going over the line and climbing aboard the steam train, the Bristolian, which he was allowed to drive to London because he was uh, such a great railman. Um, the company itself is quite interesting. Although it has an American name, it's, it, it is purely an English company. But what they did was they um, exploited the designs of George, Wash, uh, George Westinghouse, um, who invented brakes and the technology um, sorry. Uh, yeah, that, sorry, I, I can't. I can't quite remember. Um, he he invented interlocking signals and points, and um, uh, the the Westinghouse in England exploited that, and that's the only sort of thing that's uh, related to uh, to the American company. Um, now, growing up, when I got a bit older, during the 50s, what you have to remember is that England was very cut off, and the only thing that we saw of America were black and white films. And certainly Saturday morning, Friday night, was kids' shows in England. And, of course, we saw all the cowboy films and the trains and were totally and utterly fascinated by the trains. Uh, during the 50s, there was an explosion of youth, as of course there was in America. Um, and this thing called Skiffle started, which was all um, introduced by a band called Chris Barber and their, their banjo player called Lonnie Donegan. And I won't remind you, uh, Kevin, of what you said. Um, and he played a the big thing called the Rock Island Line. Now, I never realized that the Rock Island Line was an actual line. Of course, since then, I've realized that every single line in America 
has a song about it. I mean, I've written down sort of 35, but I could have written down over a hundred songs about the railroads. I don't know another country in the world that has this deep romanticism in a way, or escapism or something that has written so many songs about its railroads and some of them are absolutely wonderful the blues with people from the south escaping to um escaping to chicago um songs like the orange blossom special casey jones freight train the lnn don't stop here anymore the midnight special the uh, Warbash Cannonball, City of New Orleans, and it goes on. Even, even now you'll find like the band which uh, wrote The Weight, and one of the verses is to catch a cannonball to take me down the line. It's extraordinary how this has gone on. Um, anyway, uh, that's just an aside. Uh, my first trip to America, was um, in 1968 and I arrived to a big design a big design exhibition that was held in Macy's in New York and on one of the days that we were free to do something and a friend lent us a, um, a, a, a Ford Mustang which was very nice and my friend and I drove up to Bear Mountain because we wanted to see a bit of New York, I mean, or a bit of the country. Anyway, we arrived in this town called Cold Spring, which was in the Rust Belt, and it was pretty down and out. And um, we went into a bar and sat talking to these guys, and I suddenly heard a train. So I rushed out, and I thought I'd gone to heaven because there was this engine coming by and it was an E or an F unit with six foot lettering saying Rock Island on the side. And then I was looking at the freight cars with things like seaboard through the heart of the South. I had never seen graphics like this and they really did. I just looked at them and I said, I'm going to come back and do a book because this is wonderful. I'd never seen things like this. Um, and also at the time, there was a big thing with super graphics in New York um, and lots of uh, people like, um, or certainly, um, um, ah, I can't remember his name. Anyway, I arrived back in New York in the 70s to start photographing and the first thing I did was I walked into one of the yards in New York, just near the Times building, and started photographing. Nobody actually said anything to me, but engineers just smiled and wondered what I was doing, this long, high, long haired Englishman. And I just took as many photographs as I could of logos, because the prime, my primary interest really wasn't actually the trains, but the logos and things like this, I just thought they were just staggering. Um, the Western Pacific, because it goes through the Feather River Canyon. I mean, what a piece of advertising, rides like a feather on a freight car, and just wonderful. And this, the, um, with the Chicago and Northwestern advertising, the 400 streamliners, because it went 400 miles in 400 minutes, was it? think which is just wonderful and the uh, and then I started finding things like the piggybacks and we started photographing them and, and it well again wonderful logos <laughs> the piggyback with the Illinois Central in the middle the logo it's lovely seaboard <laughs> Um, I'm still, I'm trying to look at my notes at the same time. Uh, okay, um, I, I ended up in, in, well, actually, I ended up in St. Louis and photographing there, but this is in Kansas City. And this was very interesting. I stood there. I wasn't allowed to walk around this freight yard, 
because uh, they said there are wild dogs and the guys that went around um, had to have electric sticks uh, to keep the wild dogs, the dogs at bay. But we stood there and this train came round the bend. And I believe now it's one of the 900s of um, not very many were built. And it's now, it's now, they're all gone, I think. But the engineer stopped next to me and said, what are you doing? And uh, the ticket agent said, uh, he wants to photograph your train. So he got on the radio and uh, I thought, what on earth is he doing? Anyway, he backed his whole train down the track, unhitched the engine and brought it forward for me to photograph. And I said, how long is this train? And the agent said, well, I think this one's probably three miles long. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But he said it had come up from Texas and it's flat all the way. So there's no problem in, uh, uh, in pulling freight. There's no hills. Anyway, it was very nice of him to do that. <laughs> this is another uh, engine, and the I was delighted that the engineer was wearing the traditional, I think it's an Oshkosh uniform, which I didn't see much of, but again, because of my fascination of American railroads, I thought all engineers wore that sort of uniform. This was in Montgomery in Alabama, and I think it's a, a G, GP7. And again, I photographed it because of the lovely logo on the side. And in fact, I hadn't realized that the, um, that the actual logo was on there when I photographed it. I thought it was just Georgia. Is Jonathan on? I'm hearing, can you hear me? Ah, yes, I can, Jonathan, join but in. You can't see me, sadly. I'm trying to find a way of you, where you can see me. Ah. I'll try this ignition switch here. <laughs> it says pull out choke. <laughs> <laughs> can everybody, oh, there you are, Jonathan. We hey, can there see he you. is. Excellent. Very good. Yes, there he is. Okay. Nice, um, this, I, I was very lucky. On, on this, <laughs> I was very lucky on, on the, this first trip in the 1970s. I actually did phone, for some unknown reason, I phoned Union Pacific and said is that I'm going, I'm doing a book and it's on the graphics of the trains. Um, and I wondered if there's any chance that I could travel on one of the trains going across America. And they said, we'll come back to you. Within 10 minutes, they said, can you get up to Chicago by tonight? And I said, yes. And they said, well, you can go in the cab. And of course, I, I would have run to Chicago from New York for that. And this was, a part, this was me traveling across in the cab. That was the engineer, of course. OK. Um, these are the sort of photographs that th this one's in the book. Um, these are the sort of photographs that I was taking. That was in Los Angeles in the Vernon Yard. And interestingly enough, on the first book I did called Lost Glory, it was actually so badly printed now that I actually didn't realize there were people in that picture. <laughs> uh, it was all on Kodachrome, by the way, when I did it in the 70s, of course. And I think Jonathan might come in now. I am. I'll take over for a second, <laughs> Ian. Um, um, when I saw Ian's photographs of those ragged, scruffy, worn-out boxcars in particular, I and mean, it made me think, one, they're wonderful pictures, and there's something, of course, enjoyable about that kind of pleasing decay, and something sad about it too. But it reminded me that all those logos refer to railroads that um, used to run passenger trains and quite magnificent ones quite often. And that they also, of course, built. The railroads built America and the railroads built architecture. And um, boy, did they build architecture. Oh, fantastic. I just missed this one, sadly. But Ian's first attempt at this book, Lost Glory, reminds me of that, just that phrase, lost glory. I mean, who except a, you know, a psychotic would want to demolish this railroad station? It's the 
you know, baths of Caracalla recreated at the beginning of the 20th century in this architecture by McKim, Mead and White. And it is simply, we see the next picture, it just is the, you know, that temple to not just the railroads, but to civic culture, to the United States, it is magnificent. And the idea that the railroads were these 19th, 20th century um, reimagining of Roman roads stretching out across this enormous continental country. Um, lost glory indeed. But one thing we thought with the book is that we needed to put all these images of Ian's into context and to travel across the states in several different ways. And one of them, they're very visual ways, of course, on the end, and one way was to travel in one section by architecture. So if we moved swiftly on as the trains did, we get, oh, actually, sorry, we haven't moved on. We've just pretty much down the road here in New York, <laughs> down the street. Um, because one of the nice things is, although we're both very, very uh, romantically inclined in our view of American railroads in their glory days, the great thing is that here and there, things are happening for the better. And the new Moynihan train hall at Penn Station on 8th Avenue, that's a really good move forward. Things are lifting up again. Anyway, let's carry on our trip. Um, look at this. One of the railroads Ian and I both really like, which Ian will enthuse immensely about, is the Santa Fe. And um, look at this architecture. Not the stuff at the back, by the way, which could be absolutely anywhere, couldn't it, Ian? It could be... Um, well, uh, yes, and, and that station could have been one of those at the back. Um, uh, but apparently the people of San Diego just went port. up in arms when they wanted to pull it down. And I, it, this was only a, a few years ago. I travelled on... Again, it's the names of trains in America. I travelled on the Pacific Surfliner. Oh, what a name. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we stopped on the side of the station and I just could not believe the architecture and the style of that station and the tiles inside. Just wonderful. It's this brilliant way, which we both like, particularly as, um, as foreigners, um, of seeing how that architectural style and we'll also see design as well, can used to change very much as you travel across the States. And again, it's obvious to all of you, but to those of us who came to the States and have been many times since, um, are still in awe of the scale of the country and that enormous change of culture and character that goes across it. Um, Ian got to this station. And I was on, when I was on the train, that guy, yes, we stopped there for about Shana. half an hour. And I shot out of the cab and uh, just went round the station photographing as much as I could. And as Jonathan tells me now, it's uh, it's now a museum. It's a museum now. And this is actually uh, what I like about Ian's photograph. It's this, you know, you can see this. It's a workaday shot of a workaday railroad station with its, you know, you can see a fire escape and so on. It's all a bit, you know, matter of fact. Um, the great thing is that's already a period piece, but the building itself is an utterly magnificent, great neo-Romanesque building, like a kind of great Norman Abbey, really, um, from France or somewhere, um, reimagined out there in uh, the 1880s. Terrific stuff. But then you move further. Let's move further across. Oh, and it didn't come up, did it? I thought we had one more station in there, which was Los Angeles, LA Union. But it was just that idea that you know you travel across. I think that States. comes up comes up a bit later, John. Oh, does it? So anyway, yeah. that's a good thing. But you get the idea. So you wanted to frame all these wonderful design images in the book. So with architecture, and now Ian is going to focus in to those wonderful logos that we associate with the railroads. Yes, I mean, that, that's wonderful. The keystone state of the um, Pennsylvania Railroad, the standard railroad of the world, as they called it, mm. uh, merged with, uh, eventually with the New York Central. Um, the interesting thing is that they built their own <laughs> engines, which I found amazing, as a lot of apparently a lot of the railroads did. Um, well, they mostly bought them in for the major manufacturers, but they used to have that. They had their in house engineers, too, of course. But what's lovely, isn't it? But Ian, what we liked here, I think, was the way the railroads they stamped their identity into the Absolutely. buildings themselves. Absolutely. So. And this, this one that, that was on Cheyenne Station, of course, and that's the famous Harriman logo. 
an interesting, um, which I hadn't realized, is that uh, the, the, the overland part, because it slopes in that direction, is called, I, I, it's a, a very peculiar name and I can't quite remember what it is. <laughs> oh, it is, it's known as the Sin Bend Sinister Shield because the stripe is going to the right and it's the sinister side of the shield. <laughs> and this one uh, was, is Glendale Station, which is absolutely the most beautiful station. I, I, I must say, as a, for a small station, it's beautiful. That's in just outside Los Angeles. And that's oh, showing some of the wonderful tiles. And this is one of our complete favourites, um, Cincinnati Union Terminal, which has some trains again now. It closed in 72 to begin with. But um, so it's very short life. In 1931 here, the station opened in 32. It's... Um, only had 40 years in, you know, in its great glory days before it closed. Anyway, luckily, not all of it got demolished and part of it still exists. And what you see today, um, apart from a few trains and museums and so on, is this superb restoration of the, this meeting, in, isn't it? This meeting of design, craft, uh -huh. um, corporate identity, superb materials. And this is kind of, you know, US railroad design absolutely at its peak in the it's sheer style it's sheer i mean style. that the 1931 with the yeah. carved That's... lines is just perfect perfect isn't it great it's such, and that look at that uh, the ticket office <laughs> for the Burlington lines in denver this 1938 job what what is so great here ian's got another point i know but th what i love so much is again everything goes together look at that they're showing off the new trains in the advertising and the models in the window. They're showing off, they're totally with it in terms of the latest architecture and design and graphics. Um, and it's got this, and the photograph itself has that tremendous sense of directional energy. You know, you get on one of these trains and it's going to race you across the States. Absolutely. I, I, I love it because it's got Burlington in one style of typography mm. and a completely different style going or um going upwards um and it's very reminiscent of edward hopper's the night hawks very much and here of course the trains the uh zephyrs of course the diesel stainless zephyrs. steel yeah wonderful and it's just that it's again that, what is a sense of purpose energy engineering design um graphics corporate identity just all coming together to create this sense of immense style um you know, so the engineering is, works beautifully but this is real panache America. and this is a page out of the book by the way but and i know i i mean what gets me is that the that america could do this in the 30s and the 40s uh, why can't it do it now i mean it, well the thing that we all know isn't it that um, the huge finance and energy that went yeah, into the yeah. railroads was switched um, at every level, local level, state level, and, and federal level, of course, to the interstate highways and to the um, airline business and its infrastructure in the 50s and into the 60s. Oh, and, but, you know, the glory does remain, doesn't it? You know, who doesn't like the station? Um, um, yes. This is the, uh, what you want. And the benches. Union Just. Station, L.A., yeah, and uh, Ian, I heard that this was, um, and the audience can probably correct us if we're wrong, but I think this is, might be used for one of the, um, the Oscar ceremonies, um, or at least outside in the courtyard. Well, wouldn't that be great? It's so the, the whole thing is cinematic, and that's the thing, too, we think of American railroads. Yeah. They're associated with great films, aren't they? Not it's North by Northwest, or you know, keep going, keep going with the films. You can all rattle well, off 100 films they, each they, now. They filmed The Dark Knight in here and Blade Runner, and which I hadn't realised. But uh, it's a perfect place for the Oscars, I must say. And wonderful, those benches, which are original wooden leather benches. And they're still um, there. I yeah. forget who they were made by, but there was some uh, quite a... Well, oh, no, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, I when, when I got back from my trip, um, that that is me actually there in the seventies. I don't recognise him at all. But when I got back, um, I was so taken with the the graphics and the logos that I'd seen that I produced a, um, eight different uh, posters on tin. They, we screen printed them on tin and I did 50 of each and uh, sold them. And that's that's one of the original ones. It's so and I tr tried whenever I could to get in the name of the, of the famous train on that railroad. I think we wanted to say, Ian, didn't we hear that these logos, there's a nice spread of them from the book, they are just so different. They're so inspired and so different from contemporary corporate bland, oh. you know, banal style corporate logos, which we'll see later, I think, some of them, where everything looks like a that looks like a bank or a you know insurance company logo. Whilst these say particular places, particular people, but you know, absolutely glorious, aren't they? Look at that. Well, I I think they have a spontaneity about them and a slight yeah. um they're not designed somehow. They they've come about because of a pride in the railroad, and the they they usually were done from competition. So the ticket agents and railroad people would design them, and they would take the best one. And there's something so nice about that because it shows a phenomenal pride in that railroad. Um, designers wouldn't design things like this. So could you go back to that other one? Um, it, th this one is very interesting. It was um, obviously the co cotton belt, but it was inspired by a cotton gin. And on the next one, you can see, I mean, yes, you can about see it was yeah. sort of inspired by all the wheels and things of the cotton gin. So again, this tremendous sense of place and identity through the States. And I think that's what excited both of us, you know, um, and we both travelled right across the states, and there's from the book. There's uh, sorry that the 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 cotton belt there with the blue streak, but the G M and O was very interesting. Um, I when when I did the posters, I put the G M and O on one of the posters, and it was called the Rebel Route. And I gather the northern government uh, made them stop using um, the Texas Rebel and things like that. Yeah. And it was originally owned by a, a man called Isaac Tigret. Well, I, I, was, I knew the two people who started the, the Hard Rock Cafe, uh, Peter Morton, and the other one was Isaac Tigret. And it was his great uncle who was the owner of the railroad. And of course, when he saw the print, it went up in, he bought it and it went straight up in the Hard Rock Cafe in London. The Rock Island, I mean, that's what started it all. The Rock Island line. Lovely. And it's a beaver pelt. And then I found this box car in Kansas City. Hmm. And I think it's quite rare that hundred years of progress. And look, it was nineteen fifty-two. <laughs> Very sad. The way to the sun, the Southern Pacific, or the SP, as you call it in America, I think. And the different ways that it uh, that the logo is used on different. This one was mm -hmm. I photographed in San Francisco Railroad Station, which has now gone, of course. In fact, it, it went six or seven months after I took the photograph. And I often wonder what has happened to that bench. I would have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> that was on the side of a caboose. Most of these are actually in the book. And that, well, that would never be allowed now. <laughs> Suntan special. I can't imagine any Californians lying in the sun anymore. <laughs> and that was the introduction after the war of um, 
the suntan special going from San Francisco up to Santa Cruz. More of the lovely logos. Again, that's a page out of the book. Well, I mean, I can, you, you probably all know the ones that are down in the B&O, the Baltimore and, uh, and Ohio is the oldest railroad in America. And lovely the way they use the Capitol building. Um, and in the book, we show some much older ones than that as well. And the Atlantic Coast, and the L&N. Um, the Wabash. I, an interesting thing about the Wabash is that there was obviously a song called the Wabash Cannonball, and it became so popular that the Wabash decided to name one of their trains after the song called the Cannonball. <laughs> and then we go on to the painting. It, interesting, again, with painting on train, uh, the, so that the paint, the sign writing in America, um, it has a great, America has a great tradition of hand painted signs. I mean, all those great big uh, boards that you see in the country used to be hand painted. Um, and uh, they still sort of do it in New York, uh, ha hand paint things. And one interesting thing, I did another book, which was called, um, it was the graphics of the uh, American bombers during the war. And most of the guys that painted the pinup girls on the planes were actually billboard painters, which is interesting. And then to add consistency, of course, was the, the stencils that came off. And this is interesting. This is obviously done by the engineers department to make sure that they get a consistency in, in where the lettering should go. Again, all done by the companies, not by outside designers. Yeah. Another page from the book. Okay. Well, I don't know whether we can really say much about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine what the poor guy felt when he stood back and looked at that. He must have thrown his thrown his paintbrush down and said, hey, damn it, I'm not going to do any more. <laughs> So here's a section which we'll have to speed through, but it makes sense that we do. Um, this is, we thought, um, absolute zenith of US passenger railroads um, and everything in terms of engineering, style design, um, art, graphics, of course, was this these luxury high-speed trains that sort of in some ways um, kicked off um, in our, all our imaginations for the 20th Century Limited. Oh, um, this is wonderful. an early 20s version. But if we move swiftly on, we see how um, it's... <laughs> this is a, a post-war image of the El Capitan, the Santa Fe train. Um, but it just gives you that idea of um, America, this huge, huge country, and people taking trains as a not just as a matter of fact form of transport but as a great event look at these people it looks like um princess grace doesn't it at the front in her <laughs> yes uh, i've got a typical passenger you'd have on the train next to you and actually because hollywood stars use them a lot particularly in santa fe uh the chief and the super chief um from the mid 30s onwards but um we liked the way this glamour sort of just sort of kept going didn't it Ian right yeah. through, because this yeah. is your picture of the Kansas City Southern uh, Railway Southern Bell train um which ran from uh, as you know from um Kansas City to New Orleans and um it kept going didn't it it's a 1940-41 car isn't it yes yeah. it's lovely and um but introduced that idea of this American streamlining and this idea of these observation cars and all this world of you know chrome and Venetian blinds and subdued lighting. It's the extremely... parlor car. 
parlour car. This one's a tavern car, isn't it? Tavern observation car. I mean, great names as well. And you just, I, you just... Going, going back to that oh. Santa Fe one, I always love that ad that um, where you see the back of the 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 chief and a girl um, and the, the the man carrying her cases, and it just says she came in on the super chief. Of course, yes, she came on the super chief. <laughs> It's possible. So, let's look at some of the, and this, of course, I mean, the, the 1938 version of the 20th Century Limited. I mean, for me, that's one of the greatest trains that ever existed. And this time, actually, styled by an outside designer, Ian, for, for once, of course. Um, Henry Dreyfus, uh, is it? Henry Dreyfus, but uh, working with the engineers, of course. But what a magnificent job they did. And then creating this, um, this artwork by uh, Leslie Ragan, who uh, just capture that spirit of streamlined America and you just oh. want to be on that train don't you it's it's um, going it's going at 100 miles an hour standing still standing still and just <laughs> and this and this of course is deeply moving lost glory boy I mean this is yes. look at this this is the latest train look at it it's a you know it's oh. beautiful streamlined silver vision of the of a certain future but it's racing past what's now Rust Belt territory, isn't it? Um, yeah. And racing through the heart of industrial America. Lovely. And everything races, doesn't it? The graphics on the train race along. And it's that sense of luxury, speed, and again, all of a piece. And this, and the, 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 sorry, could you go back? This, um, that design of the drum head is just so beautiful. It's <laughs> so perfect. And again, cinematic, isn't it? It looks like oh. a, it could be from the great Art Deco cinema. Um, and then moving on very fast, because you didn't get a faster train than this, um, the Milwaukee Roads Hiawatha. And again, styled, um, again, man outside Otto Kula. Um, look at the, the amazing logo graphics and the daring colour schemes, I think also something that um, is very, very special to United States railroads. And these, of course, machines moved uh, faster than um, the arrows from Hiawatha's bow. Um, and if you look at the next picture... Um, uh, 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 oh, that's not what I thought. Sorry, it was I, 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 Jonathan, I, I, I just read what? something about the Hiawatha, which you'll love. It, it had six Creek Series eight-bedroom skytop lounge sleepers. <laughs> <laughs> sort of going to be true. Um, there were several high wealth that they Oh, and this and this look, this is an outside designer stylist too working. Uh, Raymond Lowy, of course, with the Penzi T1 duplex. Um, and it just is an extraordinary thing, isn't it? It's like a sort of looks like a vast, great mechanical shark, and um, it <laughs> travelled at unfeasible speeds and generated extraordinary amounts of power. Um, they're a little bit tricky, these locomotives, but they were certainly fast. And uh, what I find interesting, too, Ian, is that these were produced during the Second World War, uh, or at the end of the Second World War, mostly, when Britain, of course, was in a very austere time. And the American yeah. railroads, of course, just steamed through or diesel through the Second World War in great style, whilst doing a fantastic job moving freight. But um, uh, we know now, which is very nice for us, of course, is that one of these is being re being rebuilt. He won trust. Um, and uh, by 2030, we hope one of these T1s will be this will be an action. And um, the main goal is to break the world's steam speed record. The, the rotters, because at the moment that's held, of course, by a British steam locomotive, Manor, um, <laughs> which is also a very glamorous locomotive. This thing <laughs> generates more than twice the power of Manor. Anyway, um, this Otto Cooler again, the Hiawatha, the, the later edition of the Hiawatha with the big 464 locomotives, and this amazing sort of um, Martian-style observation car. It's extraordinary. Sure. American engineering was at its finest at this period. It really was. Railroad engineering, yeah, and it really I... was. And this and this colourfulness that you mentioned, didn't we? The, the, it's just glorious. You just want to... Yeah, I think this, this has actually been done much later, but I, I love it because it... It's that sort of customizing which America is for us is um, is the epitome of it, it with their cars and with planes, everything, and it's beautiful yeah. the coloring. Let's move on. And there she is, Phoebe. 
Phoebe Snow. And of course, <laughs> she was totally invented because the Lackawanna owned anthracite mines and it's they thought fuel. that they should have a young, uh, or the, the, the president thought that they should have a young socialite to travel the uh, the Lackawanna and always to be dressed in white. Phoebe Snow, dressed in white, rides the road of anthracite. Wonderful. Terrific, isn't it? <laughs> um, this is wonderful, playful stuff. Um, very bold advertising. And again, all wrapped up with the logos, the graphics. It's great, isn't it? Oh, um, it is. Tremendous. Spirited railroads. And um, Ian, we have five minutes left for your collection. Oh, my God. Just... Oh, this is a, a J J class, isn't it? Duplex J class, and oh, of course there is one. There is one restored again, Six absolutely seven. beautiful, and designed by the tool supervisor Franklin Noel. Yeah, not by an industrial stylist this time. What a great job you did! Um, and these, uh, we just love this again. It's this. Go great, go great northern. It's this, this, look ah. at this United States, America out there in front of you. Um, as you sit in your luxurious dome car, seeing your country go past like this, and it's epic stuff. And oh, it um, really is. Yeah. And you've got it all, you have got it all. That's what's so amazing. Um, just incredible. You've got it all. And, and look at all, <laughs> and then, Ian, you love all this stuff, don't you? Collect all these wonderful bits. Yes, a lot of these are my collection. I collected a lot of these from various little antique shops around America. Um, I I just happened to find one and I thought, oh my God, I didn't realise that there were book matches as well. Of course, they, they, were, they were on everything. But beautiful. A lot of these again are in the book and all these um, uh, and the breakfast. What a wonderful breakfast. Oh, food. Food in American <laughs> world. It's just very good. Okay. And a wonderful menu on the Nickel Plate Road. <laughs> just little bits to show you. A lot of this is in the book. Okay. Oh, we love this one. We love the Santa Fe. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it that, gee, that's Eaton. <laughs> you wouldn't actually get that on an English advert for the railways. <laughs> no. This was this taken at six o'clock in the morning in Salinas. And this is showing that I love those E and F units in America. They were the for me, the epitome of design, they're just beautiful, the deep, big diesels rotting away. And that's the pay, one another page from the book, all the logos wearing out. Okay. Oh, boy, we couldn't do the book without including Big Boy. And I was very lucky. I went over to Los Angeles last year, just before lockdown, and uh, photographed it in mm. just outside Los Angeles when it came in. And it really is quite magnificent. I couldn't there believe it just how there I am. Just couldn't believe how big it was. Okay. This was very interesting. I saw this in a friend's house and photographed it, mainly because obviously it had the road to the streamliners, which was part of the graphics that I like. But the coaches, of course, were designed by Raymond Lowy. And this was a publicity shot for Union Pacific. And then I went to Sa uh, Sacramento Museum number 27, and there it is, restored. Okay. And again, lovely colours and wonderful. Type probably another page from the book. Another page from the book, restoring a caboose and hand lettering. Oh, we've got one minute, Ian, on minimalism. Okay, that's appropriate. <laughs> Are we all right? Um, OK, the, this, I, I, I quite like the New Haven, the new one, actually. But the original one, of course, is on the left hand side. Um, but a lot of the new ones are very, very corporate and 
mm. not as exciting. Not they've not got the guts. I, I I know a lot of people like the Rock, but it it's it could be a cornflakes packet. Petrol station. Petrol station, yeah. Petrol station, sorry, yeah. Look at the original one. You know damn well that's the Rock Island line. Yeah. And that one. Up against the <laughs> Yeah. Against that. You, there's no comparison. Hmm. But this is interesting. Designed by Milton Glaser, the famous man who <laughs> designed I Love New York. Oh. And, and there we are. And there we are, pulling the book together graphically with this image of the streamliners um, and a sense of optimis optimism in the end. That's the point, isn't it, Ian? You know, we love yeah, these American yeah, roads. We love travelling through the States. And it's, um, it, it's that sense of, look at that, it's got everything. Destiny, power, speed, clamour. Um, American railroads absolutely had it all. And we hope that... We'll do it again in the future. <laughs> You've got the engineering to do it. You can it's really do it. The the stylist. You've got everything, the money. The, Just do the it. Chinese, <laughs> the Chinese built 15,000 uh, 15, yeah. miles high of speed rail. Railways, high speed railways in the last few Come years. Come on, America, you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much for letting us talk to you. I would just like to end by saying I'd like to dedicate this whole thing to the book designer, mm -hmm. uh, Bernard Higdon, who very sadly died two days ago. Oh. Um, and he did the most wonderful, wonderful job of designing this book. Oh. Well, Ian and Jonathan, thank you both for a superb presentation and, and your passion for our railways here in America is just infectious. It's really, really a treat to, <laughs> to be able to share that with both of you this morning. Thank you. Uh, oh. Ian and Jonathan still, uh, still with us. So I know we have a couple of questions for them too. I see Jonathan. Hi, I'm back. Hi, welcome back. All right. Thank you. So much, yeah. Um, well, Jonathan, I have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen your presentation a few times now, and it's clear that you were just so enchanted with American architecture and iconography for the railroads mm -hmm. here. And I'm curious how you feel like British architecture and design of that same age compare. Well, it's a lot more modest, of course. It's a, it's a question of scale and finance, really. Um, there are, and again, a lot of the uh, British Railway stations and the British Railways network were built um, in the 19th century, and um, they didn't really expand physically um, in the same way as the American Railroad's architecture. And the reason for that, I think, particularly is the states, some of the great stations we've seen, and miss if they've gone, are the Union stations, which, of course, they were serving several, indeed many, railroads in one great building. You just don't have that in the British Railways. Oh, like that. Individual railroads had their own stations. You didn't have those great big union stations, which we thrill to. So that's a big difference. So when you see that like that Cincinnati station, it's just, it just must have been awe inspiring when it was in, um, you know, perhaps in its heyday. Uh, but we have nothing like that in terms of scale. Oh. Or Grand Central, Central as well in New York. At Grand Central. Well, Grand Central, thank God, you know, survived. That was under threat as well at one point, which I people know. tend to forget. Incredible. And, you know, it could have gone too, and um, but it didn't. And then it's been beautifully renovated in recent years. And um, the one thing that actually is strange, though, for um, British rail users, when you come to these great stations, like uh, Grand Central in particular, you think, where are the trains? You know, yes. you see the trains. Yes. And it, I remember I was getting there thinking, what a wonderful building. It's so fantastic. It's like a great, great, you know, great art, well, art nouveau art plus art deco version of a great big Roman temple again. And um, this great ceiling and the constellations up above and, you know, wonderful oyster bar and this and that and the other wonderful place for people watch. And you think, but I can't see a single train. And when you find the trains, <laughs> they're hidden away. Even the trains are such good But pretty dismal. It's so strange. I understand why, you know, it's Manhattan and they've got to, you know, they can't run through the streets in Manhattan or across the streets. They had to burrow their way out. Um, but there was something very strange about that when you first encountered it. 
That's a good point. I mean, you know, something something I've noticed in traveling abroad is how it always makes me look differently at the U.S. when I get back. And I'm curious if, if your explorations of American railroads have made you think differently about British railroads. Um, yes, I think it's the, the, the epic scale of American yeah. railroads. Yeah. And, the, and you still, I mean, even if most of the passenger trains have gone, which is a shame, um, I hope they come back, so does Ian, um, you still get to experience uh, American freight trains rolling along, which are sensational. They're not very well known outside the States, or maybe not known to a lot of people that live in American cities, um, to watch these gigantic uh, machines, engineering marvels in action. You know, the trains can be, I mean, how long can they be? The audience know better than me. They, you know, you'll know. They can be in, in, in the West, they stretch to three miles sometimes. Three miles oh, they of do. train. Yeah. And when they come past, and we all love, we love this, uh, Again, that word epic keeps coming out, the epic nature of the American train. Today you hear those great air horns sounding, especially at night time. Oh, see, wonderful. If you stop at a crossing, any, any of you, Ian, Haley, Scott in the audience, if you st get stopped at a crossing in the States and one of these trains comes by, it's a magnificent sight because you feel the whole ground <laughs> thunders and trembles and you feel it through your body. It's, um, I think so that's it, it's the scale of the American trains. Mm -hmm. And when you put a British train against an American train, British loco against an American loco, you know, the American ones dwarf the British ones. And again, it's just, it is that scale of the country. That is, that and is. also that the, the freight trains now, the, um, the, the SD45s, they are just function. There's no sort of streamlining there. They're just a piece of function. And they, they're very gutsy, wonderful thing. <laughs> we, we had a question from one of our audience members. Richard Jordan asked if there are any particular railroad logos that you're still looking for. Ian. Oh, did what, in America? I think, well, I, I'd say America specifically, but others as well. Any, any, well, anything I, I that think you haven't with found? America I think in 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 America, I I completely missed out uh, um, by the, when I did it in the seventies because of course I was sort of doing it on the hoof and going from mm -hmm. place to place and asking people. But there were dozens of short lines in America that I missed. Um, I yes, lots and lots and lots. Yeah, we make that clear in the book, uh, Scott. Yeah. Don't we, Ian, that um. You know, there's grade one, grade two, grade three railroads. Um, and I think there are still quite a lot of these very short, small railroads in operation in the States. They're intriguing things. And it would take a hell of a long time to track them all down. Maybe well, I, I, what it's I spoke to, to the, um, the, uh, the CEO of Genesee and which was one? Genesee, uh, Genesee, and and Wyoming. Wyoming. Genesee and Wyoming, yeah. Yeah, I spoke to him about using the logos and I said, you know, how many trains do you have? He said, well, we have about, I think it was 400 lines. And some of them are only about 14, 15 miles long. And they go from a factory just onto the main line. I was amazed. I mean, they had trains in Australia and all over the place as well. But I gather it's been sold now. I think the last question we have submitted um, before we go to our break um, is Charles uh, Tuchek. I'm sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong. Um, he's curious if there, in your research or in your travels, if you've come across any um, in other countries or other railroads <laughs> that continue to embrace that type of design and architecture that you find so appealing. Oh, that is interesting. Oh, um, no. Oh, yeah, actually, I can't think of that. I think it's too, it's too great. Sorry, I think we're starting to think, haven't we, now? <laughs> Ian, what are you thinking of? No, there isn't. Oh, no, you are. No, I can tell you where. Um, you find it um, in Indian railways in India. Oh, yes, yes, you're right. Mm. Indian railway system is, is it's, you know, an extraordinary complex and uh, the crisscrossing lines across that huge country. An enormous number of lines and a lot of character and yeah, a lot of interesting is. stations and um, a lot of local um, definition. I said people do decorate trains still locally. So you'll see a train coming in and has special badges and decoration. Yeah. Actually, the Chinese used to do this. They've stopped doing it now, which is a great shame. You know, they used to 
last of their trains in obviously revolutionary slogans, but they all said the same thing. I remember going to see um, the last great new steam line um, across uh, Inner Mongolia in the late 90s. An amazing, brand new 600 mile steam line, but you know, because coal was there and available, it's now been uh, dieselized. But um, what was fantastic, every train came in, every steam locomotive came in with these masses of slogans on the front. Mm -hmm. But I think, what, what do they say? I have no idea. They all pretty much said the same, you know, progress for the people. <laughs> but I mean, they, they looked incredible because of all that Chinese calligraphy on the front. Mm, yeah. they, they were great. Um, mm. But India still has this. Yeah, it does, actually. Yeah. Well, great. I mean, thank you to both Jonathan and Ian and Phil in the background there. I think I saw him step out though. Um, and of course, Yuichi for joining us so late at night for him. Um, two fantastic yeah. presentations to start off the day. Well, Absolutely. Haley, thank you Excellent. very, very much. You, you, I've done a wonderful job and thank you to the team. I think that the CRP and A is a wonderful outfit. I really do. It certainly is, yeah. Thank Thanks you. very much indeed for inviting us. Thank it's you. our presenters who help make us shine, and all of you certainly have this morning. So thank you all so much. Uh, I'm going to put a link to, to the Logomotive book uh, website in the chat now. Uh, this is a fantastic book, uh, and certainly if you're interested in railroad design at all, I, I highly recommend you pick up a copy off the Sheldrake Press website. 